Shalom. Puji syukur kepada Tuhan Praise to our Lord Jesus Christ who allowed global webinar 2021 with a theme The Word of God Unveiled in Light of Redemptive History. Welcome to all brothers and sisters who have attended this global webinar. Thank you for your presence. May God pour His grace toward all of us who are attending this online event. My name is Yudi Lengkong, and I will guide you as an MC for the next six days. Maybe some of you are curious why the title for this global webinar, The Word of God Unveiled in Light of Redemptive History. So in the next six days, we will study and discuss this with 11 speakers from several countries. The materials presented here are entirely based on History of Redemption series books written by Reverend Abraham Park. These books have become bestsellers in several countries and have been translated into 18 languages in the world. All right, we will start this evening with prayer. Reverend Dr. Yun Du Hee will lead us in prayer. Living Father God, we thank you that the History of Redemption Global Webinar of 2021 would about to commence. In this webinar, may you open wide the door of heaven and pour your great blessings abundantly. Father, we believe that you have anointed each of the speakers in this webinar with your Holy Spirit. We believe that the speakers you have led with your wisdom and understanding so that your profound word may be proclaimed. Father, may you also bestow upon us the ears of a disciple, so that we may understand your word. In each of the speak lectures, we want to be able to concentrate, so that we may hear your voice without missing one word. Finally, we, may we all come to realize your amazing mysteries of redemption and may our hearts be ablaze. May through this webinar the sleeping souls be awake and the spiritually dead be raised so that you we so that we may lead lead a life with where the heaven is open for us. May the global history of redemption webinar establish the way of a Lord's return in the end time. We pray that starting today, through the next five days, may the internet be stable and not lose connection. We remember God, God's word is said, seek first King, God's kingdom and his righteousness. So Father, we are, we are laying, aside, laying aside all our businesses and prioritize in hearing your word with a longing heart. May each person who attend this webinar be full of heaven's spiritual blessing and fruitful land. And we pray, may Father God receive all the glory through this webinar. By lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, who is our eternal Redeemer, we have prayed and give thanks. Amen.
Seperti apa? How has the history of redemption moved so far in Indonesia? To know about this, let's listen to the foreword from Dr. Ferry Tandiono. As the head of the founders of Yayasan Damai Sejahtera Utama. Shalom, damai sejahtera pada kita. Peace and prosperity to us all. Good evening and welcome to tonight's global webinar. Praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, we from Damai Sejahtera Foundation in collaboration with our Center Foundation in Korea and also Hora Foundation in the U.S. have successfully organized and begun the global webinar tonight on the 17th of May 2021. In 2010, we, the Damai Sejahtera Foundation, received the rights to translate the History of Redemption books into Bahasa Indonesia and to widely distribute the books in this country. Our efforts in distributing these books, including organizing, uh, organizing workshops, classes, in the hopes of inviting people to know about the essence of the history of redemption books. Therefore, with the new normal taking place, we, the Damai Sejahtera Foundation, with all our might, would like to continue our efforts in spreading the Word of God by organizing this global webinar. We believe that we will be able to reach an even wider audience to all corners and islands of Indonesia at the same time and even overseas. Brothers and sisters, I can't state enough how important this History of Redemption books are. We are invited to know God's plan and designs to save His creations. Through these books, we are encouraged and to truly become mature in our understanding of our God as it is written in Ephesians 4, verse 13. These books were written by reference Abraham Park. My brethren, because of the significance of these books, we, the Damai Sejahtera Utama Foundation, have invited 12 theological experts from all nations to join us to discuss, to enlighten, give explanations and show how deep these books are. Even though this global seminar will, will not allow us to understand all the books completely, but our hope is that in the future we can frequently and continually hold these seminars where we can discuss truly and completely the depth of these books. Therefore, let us welcome the 12 theology experts that we have joined us tonight. Firstly, let us welcome Reverend Dr. Philip Lee as the head of Pyongkang Chil Presbyterian Church in Seoul, Korea, and the main speaker of the History of Redemption books in many countries. Secondly, let us introduce Reverend Dr. Warren Gage, an Old Testament lecturer, faculty president and director of Christianity and Classical Studies at Knox Theological Seminary, USA. Thirdly, let us welcome reference Dr. Yun Duhi. Fourth, let us welcome the fourth speaker's reference Dr. Paul Kim, where serves as a senior pastor in Green Hill Church, Orlando, USA. Let us welcome the fifth speaker, Reference Dr. John Debney, Senior Pastor of Bethesda Church in Arkansas, USA. Let us welcome the sixth speaker, Reference Dr. John Kim, Senior Pastor of Green Pastures Presbyterian Church in Tacoma, Washington, USA. Let us welcome the seventh speaker, Reference Dr. Andrew Park, Senior Pastor of Evergreen. Presbyterian Church in New York, USA. Let us welcome the eighth speaker, reference Dr. Samuel Kim, Senior Pastor of Science Church, Singapore. Let us welcome the ninth speaker, reference Ellen Wijaya. Let us welcome the tenth speaker, missionary Dr. Mary Park. Let us welcome the eleventh speaker, Dr. Kirin Deep Singh, 
who is a missionary from Science Eternal Covenant Church, Singapore. Lastly, let us welcome Dr. Jabez Pa. These are the 12 speakers whom we have invited to join us tonight. The Damai Sejahtera Foundation, we would like to greatly thank you for your participation in this global webinar tonight. Our greatest hope is for you, for your participants to have patience, focus, and diligence to listen and follow the history of redemption until the end. May God bless us all. As the 40-year wilderness journey ends and Moses is about to die, he commands in the book of Deuteronomy, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. Patriarchs from past generations who vanished into history are alive today, still answering questions about the days of old, revealing God's eternal, redemptive administration hidden in their generations. Reverend Abraham Park authored the History of Redemption series starting with the first book, The Genesis Genealogies, in 2007. The History of Redemption refers to the entire history in which God redeems the sinners by paying the price through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The History of Redemption series is about how the Bible reveals that redemptive history is at the heart of world history and that Jesus Christ is at the heart of redemptive history. Reverend Abraham Park is a pastor who has grown Pyongan Jail Church into 80,000 members through his 57-year ministry. For over half a century, denying all worldly pleasures, he absorbed himself in prayer, in the Word, and in evangelism. Through sleepless nights of Bible study and prayer, he raised up his entire congregation like his own children. Located in Seoul, Pyongyang Jail Church boasts a lush green campus, more than 50 acres wide, embodying both beauty and godliness. Mount Jiri in the early 1960s. The nation's spiritual mountain that is believed to have inherited the spirit of Mount Bektu. Deep in the mountains where even the cries of animals are faint, a pastor stands alone, whose prayer and Bible reading have replaced food and sleep. His prayer on the mountaintop lasted for three years, six months, and seven days. The determination to enter the mountain seclusion came after his inability to answer a young church member's question of how Jesus' blood can save humankind. It was a life-risking prayer. He prayed until the sun rose and read the Bible until sunset. There was nowhere to turn to but to heaven. He clung on to God, seeking wisdom and understanding. At last, the thunderous voice of God was heard. Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar.
as my understanding of the word grew, I repented in contrition at my ignorance of and rebellion against that amazing world. It felt as though a highway had opened up into the previously blocked spiritual world. I was so joyous, I danced like a madman in the mountains. He began to record the beating pulse of the Bible, which he understood through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Every few months, he would copy it onto the manuscript paper which he had purchased down at the Hamyang marketplace. There are several thousand copies of such manuscripts which were written through blood-laden toil. The manuscripts for the History of Redemption series were written from the Mount Jiri prayer post and decades later began to be published with the first book, The Genesis Genealogies. His research reveals for the first time ever in history things about Adam's genealogy and contemporaneous generations, the duration of the building of Noah's Ark, Jesus' genealogy from a redemptive historical perspective, and much more. All of these contents have brought a refreshing awakening not only in Korea, but around the world. He grasped the significance of the history of redemption, and from that insight came a message that would transform Korea, and in time, we are confident, will change the world as the knowledge of God's redemptive plan covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Despite being a publication on biblical studies, the History of Redemption series has sold over 450,000 copies and has become a Christian bestseller. Over 30,000 copies of the English translations up to the fifth book have been sold and are receiving favorable reviews around the world. These are the first Korean Christian books approved by the Chinese government to be officially used in China's Christian seminaries. The books have been officially translated into Hebrew, as well as being distributed in Israel. These books have been translated into over 18 different languages. As the History of Redemption series has garnered a tremendous response around the globe, a prestigious evangelical institution, Knox Theological Seminary in the U.S., awarded the author with an honorary doctorate of divinity. It's our pleasure on this occasion to present the degree Doctor Divinity to Dr. Abraham Park. Also known for its prestigious tradition, the president of Faith Theological Seminary attended the book launching of the English edition of the History of Redemption series. Reverend Abram Park has tapped into the beating pulse that lies at the heart of redemptive history via the biblical genealogies. His History of Redemption series and the seminars are contributing greatly to Christian revival around the world in places like America, Southeast Asia, Africa, and more. Domestically, the History of Redemption seminars have helped pastors to return to the Word of God, and they have proved to be valuable ministerial tools. Globally, the History of Redemption seminars have taken place in over 40 nations. In America, the seminars have been taking place in numerous cities and are still continuing successfully. The seminars garner attendances of few hundreds to several thousands of Americans in these various cities. The attendees are all reveling at how they have truly experienced the zeal and mercy of God through such unrivaled biblical lectures. 
I think it's really uh, excellent to look more closely at some of those parts of the Bible which often we skip over too quickly and realize that God has um, deep meaning uh, put into these, these genealogies and wants to teach us from them. For the first time ever, God has revealed his administration of redemption in these books. The astonishing truths contained in the History of Redemption series are finally starting to grow into waves within the movement of redemptive history. This movement will continue on until the day that God's administration of redemption is fulfilled here on earth. Some of you may ask, what is the history of redemption book? What's in it? Why are these books so important to us? Let's follow brief presentation of book review from book 1 to 11 by do reference Dr. Yunduhi. The one who translates the history of redemption series into Indonesian language. Thank you very much. My name is Pastor Yun Duhi, and I would like to introduce to you the History Redemption series. In this world, we often hear the expression, world's first. For instance, whether it's in the area of science, technology, aviation, electronics, or automobiles, or games. And likewise, within the History Redemption series, we hear the expression world's first on many occasions. These books of the History Redemption series have become bestsellers in many countries and have been translated into 17 different languages. These books were written by the author, Reverend Abraham Park, who has read the Bible over 1,800 times and has served in the ministry for over 50 years. And the books contain his sermons, which he has preached over the past 50 years. And through these books, we can come to gain a deeper understanding of the Bible. If we look at the first book, it's called the Genesis Genealogies. And this book, Genesis Genealogies, looks at the genealogies that appear in the book of Genesis from the perspective of redemption history. When we come upon genealogies in the Bible, we normally overlook them, thinking that they're not relevant to us in our lives today. But the truth is, through these genealogies in Genesis, we come to understand the characters, the, the years that they lived, and we discover mysteries. Gold becomes molded through long periods of pressure underground. Likewise, these genealogies compress long periods of time. And each person in the genealogy is analyzed using the Hebrew name and the meaning of their Hebrew names. And for the first time in the history of this world, the genealogies are organized by chronology. And through this, we learn that for the first time in this world, Adam lived with his ninth generation Lamech for 56 years. And Noah lived with Abraham contemporaneously for 58 years. And from this, we understand the importance of the inheritance of faith. And here we also learn how each person in this genealogy foreshadows Jesus Christ. 
And furthermore, this story also connects to our story today in this age. In the second book, which is titled The Forgotten Encounter, this book speaks about the process of the fulfillment of the covenant of the torch. This is the covenant that God ratified with Abraham, and it contains many mysteries that uncover God's redemptive work. In this book, we will see the four generations, which include Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We will also learn about the Israelites' exodus from Egypt and their journey throughout the wilderness as they head into the land of Canaan. And in this book, we have the map of the entire wilderness journey of the people of Israel and the 42 campsites in which they camped. And the author shows us how each campsite and each part of the journey of the Israelites through the wilderness journey is our journey of faith today. And besides these points, this book covers how Moses struck the rock two times in the, gar in the wilderness, the death of the three, three great leaders in the wilderness, and the importance and the fulfillment of the covenant of the torch, and also the significance of the burial of Joseph's bones in the land of Shechem. If you look at books three, four, and five of the History of Redemption series, they are titled The Eternally Unquenchable Lamp of the Covenant, book number three. Book number four is The Mysteries and Profound Providence of God. Book number five is The Promise of the Eternal Covenant and the Profound Providence of God. And these three books record the genealogy of Jesus Christ divided into three different terms. And Jesus' genealogy is a channel by which the Savior, the Messiah, comes to save all sinful mankind. And by studying this genealogy, we will learn God's great agape love, the love with which he has prepared the coming of Jesus Christ. And if you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it begins by calling the genealogy of Jesus Christ the book of genealogies. And the author clarifies how much secrets and lessons are contained in this one verse, calling the genealogy of Jesus Christ a book of genealogies. And each period in the genealogy of Jesus Christ is divided into books three, four, and five. It also discovers the people who are omitted from the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And this was discovered for the first time in the history of this world. And for the first time in, in the history of this world, this book uncovers the accurate chronolo chronology of the period of the judges, the time that it took to build Solomon's temple, and also the calculation of the reigns of the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Book six. Book six is titled The Eternal High Priest of the Covenantal Oath. And in this book, for the first time in the history of this world, it organizes the entire 77 high priests and their genealogies. It begins with the first high priest, Aaron, and ends with the last high priest, Phineas. It also speaks about the garments of the high priest and their duties. And the garments and the duties of the high priest give us a foreshadowing of who Jesus Christ is and his work. Jesus Christ is our eternal high priest who, who came according to the order of Melchizedek. So how do we follow this eternal high priest? This is what we learn through the garments worn by the high priests. 
In this book, we have a very detailed and accurate replica of the garments of the high priest. For instance, the linen garments, the bands and the ephods that they wore. And the, all these things were discovered for the first time in the history of this world. Book 7 in the History of Redemption series is called The Ten Commandments. And each of the Ten Commandments are analyzed using the following methods. There is an analysis of the law itself, the specific laws that derive from this law, the lessons on worship, and also the evangel evangelical expansion and the end of the violators of the commandment and the application to Adam. And it also applies the commandment to the end times. So if we look at the Ten Commandments in depth, we will discover Jesus' true image. And the Ten Commandments connect the past and the future and the Old Testament and the New Testament. And for the first time in the history of this world, Book 7 organizes Moses' eight ascents to Mount Sinai and Professor Kang Shin Tek, an expert in the Sumerian language. He says that this book is a historical book in the religion of Christianity. The eighth book is called The Fulfillment of the Covenant of the Torch. And the Covenant of the Torch, it, book eight, is a continuation of book two, the Forgotten Encounter. And in this book, we have an explanation of the ten plagues that fell upon Egypt, the exodus of the people of Israel, and the process through which they enter the land of Canaan. And the book looks at the ten plagues that fell upon Egypt, their characteristics, the purpose, the structure, who the subjects were, and what the tools were. And what is special is that it organizes chrono chronologically when these plagues fell upon Egypt. It also clarifies the dates that the Israelites traveled from Egypt until Mount Sinai and when they reached each campsite and all this information is based on the Hebrew text. It was through these ten plagues that God judged the people of Egypt. And in the end times, God will also judge all the idols of, of this world, whether it's mammonism, greed, humanism, or syncretism. Book 9 of the History of, Re the History of Redemption is called The Tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. And the author approaches the tabernacle using two methods. The first method is the telescopic study, looking at the tabernacle with a broad view. And it is through the tabernacle that all sinful mankind return to God through Jesus Christ. And here, the tabernacle describes clearly and with abundance the characteristics of Jesus Christ. And it also connects the Old Testament and the New Testament. The author also uses a microscopic method of study, and it looks at the tabernacle with a narrow view. And he explains each part, even the minute details of the tabernacle, for instance, we have pegs and boards and sockets, 
golden clasps, bronze clasps, tops of pillars. The author also looks at the Ark of the Covenant and the contents that are in the Ark of the Covenant. He also looks at the process of the restoration of the Ark of the Covenant that was taken away. And he especially looks at how long it took for the Ark of the Covenant to return to the people of Israel after it was taken. Now book 10, the book, te book 10 is titled The Ten Bestows and Ten Commands to Abraham. If there is one significant person in the history of redemption, who would it be? It is Abraham who is the first ancestor of the people of Israel and the ancestor of all those who believe. And most of the book of Genesis is about Abraham. And it is also Abraham that opens up the coming of the Messiah in the New Testament. So in this book, we learn about the ten places in Abraham's life journey. We learn about the seven great covenants that God ratified with Abraham. We look at the fulfillment of the ten bestows that God granted to, to Abraham and their relationship to the eight Beatitudes that Jesus proclaimed. And it also contains the eschatological meaning of the ten commands. And the blessing that God gave to Abraham will be inherited by all those who have become his spiritual descendants in Christ even until today and forevermore. And lastly, book 11 is called Jehovah Shama Ezekiel Temple. Reverend Abraham Park wrote the History Redemption series after praying for three years, six months, and seven days on Mount Jiri. And at the end of that long journey, there was something that he had realized by the grace of God, and that was regarding the Ezekiel Temple. And so Book 11 examines in detail Ezekiel's temple and it speaks about the Ezekiel temple and the relationship to the new city of Jerusalem which we must enter in the end times. This book deals with the 17 prophecy by deeds of the prophet Ezekiel. It speaks about the measurement, the location, and the priests in the temple of Ezekiel. It also speaks about the 25 sabib sabibs and the 25 places that Ezekiel visited within the temple of Ezekiel. It also contains a detailed, a detailed map of the temple of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, it contains a 3D animation of the whole and entire temple of Ezekiel, including all the rooms and areas within the temple. And all this has been revealed for the first time in the history of this world. And so many great mysteries in the Bible have been uncovered and discovered through the History of Redemption series. So I hope that through this series, you will come to a deeper understanding of God's work of redemption. God bless you. We will enter the first session. The speaker for the first session, who will be discussing the first book of the History of Redemption series, is Reverend Dr. Andrew Park, pastor of Evergreen Presbyterian Church, New York, USA. The title of the message is, Did Adam Repent? Did Adam repent? Meaning, did he go to heaven? 
or did he go to hell? Also, what did Adam do after he was driven out from the Garden of Eden? And does that even matter to us? Why do we even need to know this? Well, I believe it does matter and we do need to know this and we're going to find out why. Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Andrew and welcome to these lectures on the History of Redemption series. The History of Redemption series are a series of books written by the South Korean pastor, Reverend Abraham Park. And the first book in the series is called the Genesis Genealogies. How many times have you started reading the Bible and you came across the genealogy and you just stop or got stuck there? Or better yet, you just skipped right over and went on reading the other parts of the Bible. Well, the same thing had happened to me and I felt the same way about those genealogies. However, when I read the Genesis genealogies, these books opened my eyes and to help me to realize that the biblical genealogies are a treasure trove of deep spiritual truth that we need to know. So today I'm going to focus on Adam's genealogy in Genesis 5. And we're going to try to answer some of the questions that I posed to you at the beginning of this video. So number one, did Adam repent? Throughout the scriptures, Adam is depicted as the first sinner. He is the one who brought death into this world. That's what Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says. However, in his own genealogy in Genesis chapter 5, there is no record whatsoever about his sin or about the fall. It seems to be saying that God's image was passed on from Adam to his son Seth. Because in Genesis chapter 5 verses 1 through 3 it says, Adam was created in God's image. And then when he was 130 years old, he had a son named Seth in his own image. So I believe this to mean that Adam repented and he recovered, at least partially, the image of God that was in him. So at this point, we need to understand what is repentance and what does it do for us? First of all, repentance renews God's image in us. When Adam fell, the image of God was corrupted. But when a person repents, it is renewed. Not perfectly and not fully, but at least partially, the image of God is restored in us. So what is the image of God? In the History of Redemption series book number five, Reverend Abraham Park says that there are four aspects to the image of God. First, there is the moral image. Human beings have a moral image that is like the image of God. That means we know what is good and we know what is evil. However, after we fell, this image was corrupted so that our morality is not perfect. It's very imperfect and it is flawed right now. And yet everybody still knows in their minds what is good and what is right and what is evil and what is wrong. That is because that's showing us an inkling of the moral image that we had. Secondly, we have the rational and intellectual image. That means the ability to think and analyze and, and, and do things like this. That reflects the image of God. However, even the intellectual image is flawed and it's corrupted so that we don't know perfectly. Thirdly, there is the spiritual image that is in us. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So God is spirit so that we cannot see him with our physical eyes. However, those of us who have repented and accepted Jesus Christ, our spiritual image has been restored. Meaning we have received the Spirit of God 
Therefore, now we could worship God, who is spirit, in spirit and in truth. And now we have the ability to have communion and fellowship with God. We could pray to God and He hears us. And when He delivers His message to us through His word, we could hear that word, we could understand it, we could believe in it. That's proof that the spiritual image has been restored. And finally, fourthly, there's God's image reflected in our bodies. Many people think that our bodies are very evil and wicked. We need to get rid of it. But that's not what the Bible says. Even the body was created in the image of God. But due to the fall, it is corrupted and it is weak and we do sin with our bodies. However, when Christ redeems us fully, even our bodies will be redeemed from its sinful ways. So right now we know that morally, physically, and even intellectually, we're still flawed in many ways. Thus, we can conclude that God's image and those aspects have not been fully restored. However, if we come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, then we have received the Spirit of God. Repenting enables us to restore the spiritual image of God in us. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See that? When you repent and accept Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of the triune God. It is God Himself that we are receiving in us. In other words, we are being restored in our spiritual image of God. That is why we must repent. So, what is repentance? Repentance is not mere remorse or regret for something we have done wrong. For example, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 3, Judas Iscariot, after he betrayed Jesus, felt remorse, it says. He felt remorse about having betrayed Jesus. However, that is not repentance because in Matthew 27 verse 5, it says that he hanged himself and committed suicide. Judas was not saved. Therefore, remorse is not the same thing as repentance. Repentance is a response to the proclamation of the gospel. It involves our intellect, our emotion, and our will. In other words, it involves the whole person and it must be a complete turning around of our ways. So Reverend Abraham Park said this in his book. It says, true repentance involves intellectual acknowledgement of sin, confession through a broken and contrite heart, and willful renunciation of sin. Thus, true repentance begins with a change in one's thinking and goes through emotional transformation and bears fruit through a thorough transformation of the will. So let's look at Adam's repentance. Did Adam repent? I believe the answer is yes. So let's find that in the Bible. First of all, let's look at Adam's intellectual repentance. If you look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12, God came to Adam after he disobeyed and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and asked him, what have you done? Have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat from? And what was Adam's response? He said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. See, when God came to him and asked him this question, God was giving Adam a chance to repent. This was his opportunity. But how did Adam re reply? He responded by blaming his wife. 
But at the same time, you could see in this verse that he's also blaming God, right? In a roundabout way. He says, the woman whom you gave me. So he's trying to throw the blame on God. He's not repenting at all. He's playing the blame game here. And then in Genesis 3.15, God proclaims the gospel. Genesis 3.15 is called the proto-gospel. Proto means the first. So this is the first proclamation of the gospel in the entire Bible. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is the proto-gospel. When it's talking about her seed, meaning the woman's seed, the seed of the woman, this is a prophecy regarding Jesus Christ, the Messiah. This is the first gospel. God is saying, I'm going to send the seed of the woman, the Messiah, who will come and bruise the head of the serpent. And when Adam heard this message, when he heard the proto-gospel, his heart changed. Because in Genesis 3.20, Adam names his wife Eve. He gives her a new name. The name Eve in Hebrew is Hava, which means living. So there it says in Genesis 3.20, Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. This renaming of his wife reveals the fact that Adam had a change of heart and that he accepted the proto-gospel. He believed in it. Because just a few verses before in Genesis 3.12, he was blaming his wife. And then he heard the proto-gospel and realized that the Messiah will come as the seed of the woman, meaning through his wife. He's going to come as a descendant of hers. So that's why he names her Eve, meaning the living. She's going to be the mother of all the living. That proves that he believed in the gospel, that he had a change of heart. He was no longer blaming his wife. See, he had an intellectual acknowledgement of his own sin. Secondly, let's look at Adam's emotional repentance. According to Psalm 51 verse 17, it says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So this, I believe, is how an in emotional repentance will look like. A broken and a contrite heart. And wh when did Adam have this kind of a repentance? Well, I believe that Adam had this kind of emotional repentance when his son Abel died. How can a parent not repent when his oldest son, Cain, killed the younger brother, Abel. And remember what Romans 5.12 said. Sin came into this world through Adam. So Adam knew this. Adam knew that they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden because of what he did. Adam knew that sin had now entered into humankind because of his original sin. Adam knew that if he had not ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would still be living inside the Garden of Eden, that his sons would not have done these things. So as a parent, Adam must have felt extreme remorse. He was broken and contrite in his heart for the death of his younger son, Abel. This was, I believe, the moment where Adam went through a transformation of his emotion. He had a, a, a complete emotional repentance here. And then thirdly, true repentance involves a willful turning away from sin. Now, when did Adam do this? Well, this is not just a momentary one-time thing, but this has to be an ongoing thing throughout his life. And I believe that Adam willfully turned away from his sin. When he had that emotional repentance, he had that kind of a, a, a willful determination in his heart. But it is shown after he had his third son, Seth. The Bible says that after uh, some time had passed, God gave to Adam and Eve another son named Seth in place of Abel. And when he had his son Seth, Adam now realized 
that his sin is being passed on to his progeny, his descendants. So when they are born, the sin is in them. However, he also realized that his repentant faith is not being passed on naturally. He needs to teach his children about faith and about God and about living a life of faith. See, he realized this through the death of his son Abel. Therefore, Adam was now determined to not make the same mistake again. He was determined to teach the word of God to his third son, Seth. He was determined to pass on this faith to him so that his son, Seth, will recover the image of God as he had done. So now at this point, I want to throw that question one more time. What did Adam do after he was driven out from the Garden of Eden? Well, this is what he did. Adam preached the word of God. Adam passed on the faith to his descendants. This is what he did his entire life. Even outside the garden, Adam continued to preach the gospel that God taught to him and he passed on the faith. So that's why in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, it says that he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. This image is the image of God that he had recovered by repenting, and he was teaching it to his son Seth. You see, as sinners, all of us, all human beings must be born twice in our lifetime. First time physically through our mother's womb, but the second time, we need to be born again through the Word of God and through His Spirit so that we could recover the faith and the image of God in us. And as parents, we must be responsible for both births. Not only the physical birth, but we must be responsible for the spiritual birth. We must teach the Word of God to our children. Adam failed to do that with Cain, but he was determined to do it with Seth and with all of his other descendants. And not only that, God enabled him to live for a long time, for 930 years. So he had plenty of time to do this. And this longevity enabled him to continue to pass on the faith, not only to Seth, but even all the way down to his ninth generation descendant, Lamech. So at this point, let's look at Adam's genealogy. If you read Genesis chapter 5, it lists all of the genealogy of Adam from Adam to his 10th generation, Noah. It lists what, how old they were when they had their sons, how much longer they lived, and how old they were when they died. So let me just basically sum up this genealogy. It says that Adam was 130 years old when he had his son, Seth. And Seth was 105 years old when he had Enosh. Enosh was 90 years old when he had Kenan. Kenan was 70 years old when he had Mahalalel. Mahalalel was 65 when he had Jared. Jared was 162 when he had Enoch. Enoch was 65 when he had Methuselah. Methuselah was 187 when he had Lamech. And Lamech was 182 when he had Noah. So, that is basically a summary of the genealogy in Genesis 5. So what does this genealogy teach us? It teaches us many things, of course, but I'm going to focus on one thing today. If you add up all these numbers from 130, you know, Adam had en uh, Seth when he was 130, Seth had Enosh when he was 105, etc., etc. When you add all these numbers all the way down to 187, and you add it all up, you get 874. What does that mean? What is 874? 874 is how old Adam was when Lamech was born. Adam was 874 years old when his ninth generation descendant Lamech was born, and Adam died at the age of 930. So if you subtract 874 from 930, you get 56. That means Adam and Lamech lived together contemporaneously for 56 years. This is something that has been revealed for the first time in history by Reverend Abraham Park in his book, The Genesis Genealogies. But what does this mean? Why is this important? Well, during those 56 years when Adam and Lamech lived together, 
Adam taught the word of God to Lamech. Adam passed on the faith to Lamech. How do I know this? Is there any proof? Well, yes. In the Bible, it does tell us this. In Genesis chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, this is what it says. Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. This is Lamech naming his son Noah. The name Noah means rest or comfort. And why did he name him Noah? It, the Bible tells us his reasoning for why he named him Noah. It says, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands, arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Lamech here is confessing that the hardships in human life all come from the curse that is put on the ground. And he is expressing his hope that his son Noah will become the one who will rescue mankind from this curse. What is strange here is that the cursing of the ground took place inside the Garden of Eden. God cursed the ground before Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden. That means only Adam and Eve were the ones who knew about this cursing of the ground. See, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, God cursed the ground before they were kicked out of Eden. So how did Lamech know about this? Lamech knew about this because Adam taught it to him. Adam was the only one who knew about this. So he must have learned it from Adam and from the other ancestors who learned from Adam. So as we saw in the above chronology, Adam and Lamech lived together for 56 years contemporaneously. So they had plenty of time to teach and learn. And during that time, Adam must have diligently preached and taught his descendants about the gospel, about his own sin, about the Garden of Eden, about what God did for them, about his own repentance, and all these things. Moreover, Lamech's confession teaches us one more thing that Adam taught Lamech. And that is the fact that Lamech was hoping for and believing in the coming of a Messiah. See, Lamech thought or hoped that his son Noah will be the one who rescues mankind from this curse. In other words, Lamech was thinking that Noah will be the Messiah or the seed of the woman whom God will send to save mankind from their sins. That was the proto-gospel, right? In Genesis 3.15, Adam heard this in the Garden of Eden and he repented. But now Lamech knows about the content of this proto-gospel. This also is proof that Adam must have taught this to Lamech. So Adam's confession in Genesis chapter 5, verses 28 and 29 is clear evidence that Adam taught Lamech the word of God, that they met, they taught and learned from each other, and the, the faith of Adam was passed on to Lamech. So in conclusion, the genealogy from Adam to Noah is a summary of the entire history of redemption. It's a summary of the entire history of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Because Adam is the first man, right? The, the biblical story begins with Adam. And who is Noah, the 10th generation? Noah is the, the man of the end. In Genesis 6.13, it says, Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. Says, this is talking about the flood. So the Noah's flood was an, a, a, an end of the initial world. But more importantly, Noah's flood foreshadows the judgment that is to come in the end times. Jesus clearly said in Matthew 24.37, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. So Noah foreshadows the end times, and he foreshadows the returning Christ. So this genealogy from Adam to Noah is a 
succinct summary of the entire history of redemption. So what is this genealogy teaching us today? It's telling us how to prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Adam, we must repent. We must repent of all of our sins so that we are filled with the Spirit of God and that we recover the image of God. And then, just like Adam, we must pass on the faith to our children and to our descendants, to our neighbors and friends, to whoever will listen. And the content of that faith that we need to pass on is what I would like to call the Messianic faith. This is what Adam taught to Seth and to Lamech and to all of his descendants. He taught them about the proto-gospel, about the seed of the woman, that God promised that He will send the seed of the woman, the Messiah, to save us and rescue us from our sins. That's the content of the faith that we need to be passing on to our children and to our descendants. So let us prepare our faith and hope and wait eagerly for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the best way to do that is to pass on the faith to our children first. And by so doing, may we be able to accept the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. At first, Adam missed the opportunity to repent. However, he repented in the end through the gospel. And as a result, there is inheritance of faith. May this inheritance of faith continue upon all of us. Amen. Next, we will hear a testimony about the history of redemption books that will be delivered by Dr. Bambang Nursena, M.A.M.H. He is the founder of the Institute of Syria Christian Studies, ISCS, and an observer of Middle Eastern Studies and an activist for Islamic Christian Theology Dialogue. Shalom. Dr. Abraham Park mengawali bukunya. Dr. Abraham Park began his book very interestingly from the book of Flow, from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 7, which says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of all generations. Ask your father and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. Usually, when we study the historical science within Bible, there is a big tendency towards boredom. Christians get bored with the numbers of years, ages of the characters. So, many only stress on the events in broad sense. To me, reference Abraham Park wrote very well, for he could integrate both the years with the events, both which are very emphasized within God's Word. The expression Zakor Yemot Olam, remember, do not forget the days of old. That is linked with the years. Binu Senot Dorvador to consider the years of the past generations. And this is very interesting. Even in the Word of God, that becomes the source reference of reference Abraham's path. Writing, ask your father and he will inform you. Ask your elders, the Seknim, and they will tell you. This is a transmission of past events that, that are passed down to the following generations continuously with no loss. And this is the importance and link between the years and the events. Dr. Park was the first 
who observed the important relation between the years of the historical events and theological lessons that God gives to all His children. That is why, when God created the heavens and the earth, within a time period or in days, after that, after the creation of the heavens and the earth, immediately was the expression Toledot, that is genealogy. Semayim we eret made the heavens and earth. Also when God created Adam and Eve, then Adam and Eve fell into sin and let fallen life with all its dynamics. dynamics. Lord always God in fault intervened in the lives of the forefathers of mankind. Later on, after all the events were taught, the description Toledot of Adam follows. There is the genealogy of Adam. Likewise, the Toledot of Shem, Toledot of Abraham, and so on. These are very important for behind all this, as I observe from the writing of Dr. Pa, all of those genealogies would be fulfilled through the coming of Jesus Christ, whose gospel also begins with Biblos Geneseos, Jesus Christ. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And the expression of Biblos Geneseos brings remembrance to Seper Toledot, Toledot Yeshua Hamashiach, where there are the emphasis was the fulfillment of Ben David Ben Abraham. And thus the genealogy is very important because with us understanding the genealogy, then we fulfill what is said by word of God, Zakor Yemot Olam. Remember the days of old, Binu Senot Dorvador, and consider the years of the past generations. There God was working within time there is the history of the salvation of mankind which is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I minister in the community of Muslims, especially through theological dialogues in various Islamic universities, even to traditional Islamic schools. Often I was asked, why is reading the Bible feels boring? It's long-winded, exhaustive, and repetitive. For example, Adam was 130 years old when he begot Seth, so Adam lived uh, 930 years and he died. Seth lived 105 years when he begot Enosh, so Seth lived until 912 years and he died and he died and he died. After mentioning the ages, it feels boring. Usually I answer, only by comparing the culture between the ancient Semitic communities with the Islamic genealogy. For whether Judaism, Christianity, or Islam were all born in the Middle East community. But after I read the writing of Reference Park, I found an easier way to minister them by telling them to try and see beyond the number of years or the ages of the characters, but to also see behind all those God has planned and there are discussed in details in reference Park's book. That is the important benefit of the book for me to my ministry, specifically to bridge the gap of understanding between the ancient society and the modern society. For example, the new society, the modern society, they tend to measure. And this is not only talking about the Bible, even talking about general history. There's tendency for the people to measure what happened in the past with the same measurement as today despite the difference in historical dynamics and complexities. And such people will more likely blame the Bible. We hardly live together with five generations back. 
I still experience living with five generations before me. So, from my parents, my father, mother, the parents of my mother, my grandmother, and the parents of my grandmother, and that is four generations. Such lifestyle of the modern society is used as measurement to the time of the Bible. For example, Shem was still alive in the time of Abraham and that is depicted in detail in the book of Reverend Park, beginning with how the ages are not merely presented as usual boring presentation, but in a very unique detail and yet not boring. From Shem, Arpaksat, Shala, Iber, Pilek, Reu, Siru, Nahor, Terah, Abraham. A while ago, I read books of archaeology findings that, that such old ages are proven from the archaeology findings according to ancient texts. But this book to me have been more illuminating and made people more in love with the Word of God because it's not merely linking genealogies ages but also relating them to the events and the characters told by the Bible. Thus, this book leads people to understand more that about God in the Bible. God that manifests himself as Jesus Christ is truly the God of history, the God that always intervened in all the trials in the lives of his people from time to time. And through the stories presented from the time of Adam and so on, it would lead to the fulfillment to Jesus Christ. As the Bible says, when the time is fulfilled, God will send forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. It's written in Galatians 4, verse 4. Finally, I would recommend every servants of God, students of theological seminaries, theological schools, even to comparative religion scholars, scholars, something that I've devoted to all of these years will be blessed and illuminated by reading this book. Truly, the approach of uh, the approach was chronological, detailed, and deep in its theological view especially in biblical theology. But also may this book bring as many people to love the Word of God more and to understand the amazing almighty works of the loving God in the history of the world and the history of mankind. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless us. Shalom Aleikum Beshem Ha Mashiach. Thank you for Dr. Bambang who has shared his testimony that strengthened all of us. I'm inviting all of you, my brethren, to praise God together. With Miss Sari Simorangkir, with a praise entitled, For God, Nothing is Impossible. Shalom Bapak Ibu Saudara Terkasih di dalam Tuhan Yesus Kristus Senang sekali saya Sari Simorangkir bisa hadir bersama dengan Bapak Ibu Saudara Di acara webinar internasional yang diselenggarakan oleh Yayasan Damai Sejahtera Utama Untuk membahas 11 buku seri sejarah penebusan yang ditulis oleh Pastor Abraham Park Buku ini sungguh-sungguh sudah banyak memberkati bangsa-bangsa dan tentunya saya berdoa lewat webinar ini Bapak Ibu Saudara Terkasih bisa diberkati dan mendapat banyak kasih karunia. Izinkan saya untuk menyanyikan sebuah pujian untuk Tuhan kita Yesus Kristus yang berjudul Bagi Tuhan Tak Ada Yang Mustahil. Tuhan Yesus memberkati kita semua.
We will enter 
yang akan dibawakan oleh special lecture by Dr. Warren Gage. He is an Old Testament professor from Knox Theological Seminary USA, and he is one of many people that has fallen in love with History of Redemption series books. And he has worked together with our center to use the History of Redemption books as the one of the study book in Knox Theological Seminary. Dr. Warren Gage will give a special lecture about why genealogy is important. I want to give my greetings to the Christian people in Indonesia at uh, the History of Redemption Center in Yayasan, and it has been uh, my honor to receive the invitation to speak at the conference that's being planned for uh, March of this year, 2021. And it's exciting, uh, first time formally I've ever addressed a community in Indonesia. It's always exciting when there is a, a, a new part of the world where the kingdom of Christ is being brought to mind. And when Peter begins his epistle, he, he celebrates the fact that the gospel is spreading all over Asia Minor. So he, he names Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and uh, he mentions Asia. And when, when Paul talks about his missionary journeys, he's always celebrating the gospel going into Cyprus and then into Pamphylia and Cilicia and on into Crete and Illyricum and Rome and he even speaks of Spain. So it's the, the apostles took great delight in seeing the spreading of the gospel in the Roman world and it's our delight to see that the gospel as our Lord directed is being taken to all the nations of the earth. That is the mark of the gospel age. And so it's exciting to see that. And I hope that what we share together will, will be of benefit to the edification of the church in Indonesia. That would be a great delight to my heart. So uh, I, I've been asked to speak about Dr. Abraham Park's uh, project, his large enterprise, and specifically the introductory volume that he did called The Genesis genealogies and God's administration of the history of redemption. And I want to do that by trying to speak to the idea of why are genealogies so important in the biblical record itself. Very carefully these generations are laid out for us and there's, there's significance to it. I think if we begin to think of it in its generalities, why do we have genealogies in the Bible? The Hebrew word for genealogy is toledot, and that is a nominal uh, noun. It's a noun derived from the verbal form yalad, which is to give birth. So it looks to the, the begetting, the, the, act, the, the generating of uh, children, uh, particularly from the woman. It has to do with uh, that, the, the, the birth of children in, through the different generations. And uh, you have two major genealogies that Dr. Park speaks about. There are numbers of genealogies. But two are tied together specifically, and that's the genealogy in Genesis 5, uh, which is the, the genealogy of Seth. And it's called the Sefer Toledot, the book of the genealogies. And that language is picked up in Matthew. In, in Matthew chapter 1, he talks about the Biblios Genesios, that is the book of the generations, but it's the Greek rendering of that Hebrew expression. And I think that that gives us our first, perhaps, thought about why we have genealogies. We have prophecies in the Bible, and the prophecies begin, uh, the redemptive program of God begins, of course, after the fall of man, and in Genesis 3.15, God gives the promise of a Redeemer. And he says that the Redeemer will come from the seed of the woman. And so that really is a uh, yalad. It's a toledot. The seed of the woman will bring forth a, a Redeemer to redeem the world. 
And so all the world is looking for this Redeemer, uh, who we're told remarkably will be the seed of the woman. And that's an unusual expression because seed in every language is associated with the male, not the female. So uh, as we see in the event, since we know the full uh, manifestation of the seed of the woman from the New Testament, uh, that will speak to the virgin born uh, Christ, who is literally the seed of the woman. His only father um, was God, and in that he shares a likeness to Adam, whose only father was uh, God himself. And so we have the genealogies are derived from the promise of God to send a redeemer who would be the seed of the woman. And so to, to express the fulfillment of that prophecy, very carefully these, these genealogies are set forth in Scripture until Christ comes. And then the genealogies cease because they have found their fulfillment and God has kept his promise to bring forth the seed of the woman, which of course is Christ. Now the whole world is looking for the seed of the woman. That is the promise of the Redeemer of the world. But we come, when we come to Genesis 12 and we have the second calling of Abraham in Haran, the covenant that is expressed in Genesis 12 uh, tells us that that seed uh, will come through Abraham, through his particular family. And of course, we've already narrowed it down to the three sons of Noah, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the seed, of course, will come through the line of Shem because Abraham comes from Shem. And so we're tracing these genealogies. It's, we're going to come to the royal genealogy in Matthew, which will look back retrospectively to, uh, to prove that Jesus is in truth the legitimate seed of the woman because he is the heir of Abraham and David. And the promise of Abraham that he would have a seed through whom the world would be blessed, all the nations would find blessing in that seed, uh, that blessing, that seed would come through Abraham. But when we come to David, by that point we've learned that the seed will come through Judah. And then ultimately uh, with David, when God uh, elects David to be the king, the covenant that he enters into with David promises that the the seed of the woman will come through the line of David. And so we're, we're, we're finding it's like a funnel. We're becoming, we're coming more and more narrow from the seed of the woman, which is very generic, to we've come now to the nation of Israel, uh, the descendants of Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, but we've identified Judah as the one to whom the scepter will be given. And then we come to the, the clan of Jesse in the family of David. And so we begin to see how the genealogies are showing us that history is being moved along. Redemption, the program of God, is being moved along in this ever-narrowing uh, pattern of genealogies. And so the genealogies enable us to trace the faithfulness of God in directing sovereignly and directing uh, human history to bring it to that great redemptive end with the seed of the woman who would come. So all the world is looking for the seed of the woman to restore the world, all the world of faith. But Israel particularly is looking for a Messiah. And the seed that will come through David is called the Messiah. He's the anointed one. And there are three offices that are anointed. And he would have the prophet, priest, and king, the seed of the woman who would come. And we know in the event that Christ is the legitimate heir of David, so he has the scepter of David is his own by uh, right of his birth taken through his legal right taken through his father uh, Joseph. Uh, and he's of the seed of David uh, through his mother Mary. So he has, he's, has the, he's entitled, by right and title, he takes the anointed office of king. Uh, he is also a prophet. The Spirit of God is upon him. And so that too was an anointed office. And he will take the, uh, the anointed office of the priest as well. Uh, it will not be the priesthood of Aaron that was forbidden for the king to exercise priestly authority. But Christ, when he comes, will have a higher order of priesthood. He will take after the order of Melchizedek, according to the prophecy of David, in Psalm 110, 
And so Christ will have all three of these anointed, these Christological offices in his one person. And he is very uniquely, as we will see, the seed of the woman. And what that means is very specific. So he will be the one who will redeem the world, but he is also, because he has these offices uh, that enable him to accomplish his redemption, he will be the Messiah who will redeem Israel, and then the seed of the woman who will redeem the world. And those two ideas of the seed of the woman and the Messiah of Israel, the seed of the woman who would uh, bring redemption to the nations and the Messiah who would bring redemption to Israel are brought together in the family in the house of David. And so Christ then will uh, have those two roles to redeem Israel and the nations. And the genealogies then promise us the seed. Uh, Paul calls them the genealogies, the covenants of promise, because the genealogy, the authority of the, of the covenant, the mediatorial role of the covenant was passed from father to son. So it will go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, to Judah, and then down through that particular clan and tribe in Israel. And that's how God is chosen to develop uh, his promise till we come to the fulfillment in Christ, uh, who is the, the fulfillment of the seed of the woman and the Messiah. And so the, the covenants of promise are, I think, when Paul uses that term, uh, talking about the nations, we are brought in, we who were strangers are brought in, and we were aliens to the covenants of promise. The promise is the messianic seed. And that's significant because it puts a distinction between the covenant of Moses uh, in the Reformed tradition. There are two ways of approaching the covenant of Moses, and some of them, some Reformed theologians, incorporate the, the covenant of Moses into the covenant of grace. And then there is a minority, but still uh, a very uh, respectable minority of, of uh, Reformed scholars who distinguish the Mosaic covenant. And I think that they are the ones who are really correct in this sense that the covenant of Moses is gracious in the sense that it tells us about our sin. It, I, it diagnoses our sickness, if I can use that metaphor but it cannot heal us of our sin. It can diagnose it, but it cannot heal it. That will take the promise covenant, the promise seed, and the distinction between the covenant with Moses and the covenant with Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, and Judah, and that particular lineage is that the covenants of promise are called covenants of promise because they promise a seed. There is a genealogy that is being advanced. Moses is outside of that structure. Moses promises us no redeemer. He promises no seed. There is no significance to his seed. It's a profoundly significant covenant, but it is outside organically of the covenants of promise. And Paul talks about it. It's mechanical. It comes in uh, 400, and, uh, 400 years, 430 years after the covenant with Abraham, and then uh, it finds its fulfillment in Christ. So it is mechanically part of the covenantal structure of the Bible, but is not organic to it. It doesn't promise us the seed. But if we're to see how God is faithful, and he is, he is wonderfully faithful in, in accomplishing and fulfilling his promise, promises to us and giving us this Redeemer, we have to understand that that's developed through the genealogies, and they are a vital part of Scripture. I want to help to establish that to, uh, with us. Uh, today, uh, they're a vital part of uh, Scripture, and they have much instruction. And when we're asked, when Dr. Park says, remember the days of old, consider the years of all generations, ask your father and your elders, and they will inform and they will tell you the way you do that is by reading the Scriptures. And these are the, this is the legacy of faith that comes from our elders and from our forebears. And they testify to the faithfulness of God. We can rely upon him. He is a covenant-keeping God. He is a redeeming God. And it is a history of redemption, which is, which is wonderful that there is such a thing uh, when we consider the extent of our revolt and sin. So let's consider uh, a little bit about the nature of the covenant. Uh, based on Genesis 3.15, as I've said, we're promised that there will be a seed given to the woman. 
and there will be a seed also given to Satan, to the serpent. Uh, that oracle uh, speaks, it's really God speaking his condemnation over the serpent, but he says, I will put enmity between your seed, that is the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. God will put an enmity, which is a quarrel unto death, as we will see. And then he foretells the destiny of the program because the seed of the serpent will have his head crushed by the heel of the seed of the woman. And that implies that the, the, the seed of the woman will be standing, which is the posture of life and victory, and the serpent will be condemned to crawl upon the ground and the heel, the, the seed of the woman will be bringing his heel down to crush the head of the serpent, and right at the last second, the serpent will strike the heel. And that seems to be the dramatic moment that is spoken to in this very significant oracle, um, which is one of the first um, promises of the gospel, the first literal promise of the gospel. Uh, there are other promises of the gospel before this passage, but they're more figurative. This one is, a, is an actual promise that there will be a redeemer given to the world. And um, that redeemer, it will be the seed of the woman. Now, that's very unusual language. Uh, ultimately, we know that that speaks of, of Christ who was virgin born. Uh, that was prophesied by Isaiah, Isaiah 7:14. a virgin will conceive and bear a son. The Hebrew word there is often uh, criticized. Um, Isaiah uses the word um, alma, and it's a, uh, an, unwoman, it's an unmarried single woman. It can mean virgin, but there's a, a normative word for virgin in Hebrew. It's Bethula. But this one uh, can mean virgin, but in, not in every case. And so the, there are critics who will say, well, Isaiah wasn't really foretelling the virgin birth, um, but that should be refuted, first of all, because Matthew and um, Luke both quote that verse, and they use the word parthenos, which is a virgin in the full sense of that term when they quote it. So these inspired writers, Matthew and Luke, are seeing it as a virgin. And then the translators of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, 150 years before Christ, pre-Christian, when they rendered the Isaiah passage in 714, they rendered it with parthenos, which is the Greek word for virgin. So uh, we're on solid ground when we understand that the promise is that there would be a seed of the woman who would redeem um, the world, Israel and the world. And so um, we come then to the, the commentary of Dr. Park. The first one is on the genealogies in Genesis moving us toward the covenant with Abraham. And so um, how I want to talk about these covenants and these genealogies in two parts. The first part, I want to jump ahead in the Bible and think how would the history of redemption be carried out when the seed of the woman, uh, that is the seed of the virgin, uh, actually appeared? What would that look like? What's implied in Genesis? developed in the Gospels that would show us that Jesus truly is the seed of the woman as, as the promise was. And the second part, I want to look at the entire history of Israel and I want to uh, consider, uh, I want to consider how is it that we have pictures of that struggle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. What, what pictures are given to us that show that 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 struggle uh, is, is being expressed in the history of redemption as we're moving forward because those quarrels between the one who will be in the line of the seed of the woman and the, the one who will be in the line of the seed of the serpent, when they erupt periodically, and I want to look at seven illustrations of that, we will see that God is furthering his program and he is developing his program in line with the prophecy in Genesis 3.15. So the first part of the uh, discussion is I want to consider the redemption of the seed, Christ, what was that to look like after he was born. Now Jesus was the virgin born seed of the woman. I've talked about that quite a bit. Matthew and Luke testify that Mary of Nazareth was in fact a virgin. She had not known a man who conceived and gave birth to Jesus. 
Matthew cites uh, Isaiah 7, 14 to describe Jesus as virgin born, the unique seed of the woman, and, see, and, and Luke does too. Uh, uh, Luke in one, uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 34. So it's very clear that they are understanding and they're presenting Jesus as the seed, unique seed of the woman. But then, well, if there is the seed of the woman, then there must be somewhere around the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent is also identified early on in both Gospels. Matthew and Luke tells us that when Jesus began his ministry, the seed of the serpent also appeared. Now, who were they? We are told by both evangelists that the Pharisees and Sadducees from Jerusalem came to see John's baptism. They did not come to participate. We were told that they had no sins to confess in a very ironic language. Um, so they did not participate, but the publicans and the harlots participated in the baptism because it was a baptism for repentance. And the self-righteous uh, religious leaders of Jerusalem uh, pretended or imagined that they had no sins to confess. But they went down, John was attracting such crowds down uh, by the Jordan. It was quite a phenomenon, really. They were coming from everywhere. So the religious leaders from Jerusalem went down to see what he was all about. And when John saw them, John the Baptist, in the spirit of prophecy, looked at them and said, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And so John, who uh, we are told in, in uh, John the Baptist, in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, identifies Jesus when he sees him as the Lamb of God. That is, he will be the sacrifice that will redeem the world. Um, and Matthew and Luke have presented Jesus as the seed of the woman, virgin born. But... Um, John the Baptist has identified the religious leaders, it's very ironic, of Jerusalem, uh, the ones that we would normally think of as being the ones, the scholars of the Bible who would have accepted the Christ or as the ones who would be his chief opponents. And he calls them the brood of vipers, which is calling them essentially the seed of the serpent. He's identified the, uh, with Christ, he's identified the protagonist, the, the main character, who will be the triumphal character, but also the antagonist, the enemies of, of Christ. And they are the religious leaders of Jerusalem. And so he calls them the brood of vipers, the seed of the serpent. That means that the conflict that was spoken of in Genesis 3.15 is at hand. The seed of the serpent speaks more of their spiritual state than their physical state. It's not a lineage that is derived from the serpent. It is a lineage that is derived spiritually from the serpent. They are of the evil one, as, as John says of, uh, of uh, Cain, uh, the seed of the evil one, the spiritual seed of the evil one. And the religious leaders in Jerusalem will be the one who will conspire to destroy the seed of the woman on the cross, as we know, when the great conflict uh, appears. And the nails that are driven into Christ's feet will bruise the heel. The great battle foreseen in Genesis 3.15 is at hand, and that's the, that's the point, the way that the Gospels are presenting it. Right away, here is the seed of the woman in Christ, and here are the seed of the serpent, and that conflict will culminate at the conclusion of Christ's three, three-and-a-half-year ministry in Jerusalem at Passover. Now, we're told in 1 John 3, 8, that for this reason Jesus came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil. So that's the purpose. That's what redemption would look like. It would be the undoing of the work of the enemy. Uh, that would be to undo the consequences of the fall in the garden. Abraham's second calling promise in Haran meant that, that the blessing of the nations would go out to all the seed of Abraham. So after that great battle takes place where the, the seed of the woman will be bruised in the heel and the head of the serpent will be crushed, the gospel will go out freely to all the world. And that's the promise that's given in Genesis 12.3. So uh, we're being told that peace with God uh, will be achieved by the seed of the woman. And how does he do that? And he does that, he's, he's going to do that by undoing the consequences of the fall. 
And he, it's, it's beautiful the way that the scriptures harmonize, the way that he does that is very strategic and very deliberate. The cross of Christ, where he wins our redemption, and the resurrection of Christ, where he justifies us and gives us his righteousness, those two events are both necessary to have the gospel. Uh, the cross, if there is no resurrection, Paul says the cross is in vain. We have to have the resurrection. We have to have the cross where our sin is imputed to, to Christ and he suffers in our place. We have to have that aspect. He, takes the, he suffers in our place on our behalf out of his gracious heart. But we also have to have the resurrection, which is God accepting the merit of his sacrifice on our behalf and by which he imputes his righteousness to us. That is the gospel. That's the saving message of Jesus Christ. And to believe in that, uh, if we believe in our hearts that God has raised Jesus from the dead, which implies his death on the cross, uh, Paul says we are saved. So that's the saving message of the gospel. But that message is framed by the evangelists in a number of ways. One of them is it's framed by two suppers. Before Jesus suffers, there is the supper we call the Last Supper. It's the Passover Supper. And that's before he suffers on the cross and is resurrected. And after the resurrection, there is the supper that Luke tells us about with the disciples in Emmaus. And so the, the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection is framed by two suppers, and that's significant. Why is that significant? Well, we have to re remind ourselves of how the fall took place. When Satan tempted Eve, she saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, desirable to make one wise. And the way that Moses describes the fall of man, he says, she took of its fruit and ate and gave to her husband with her and he ate. It sounds so simple, but the consequences were disastrous for the whole human family as we know. And that's why we need a redeemer. But the sin that brought all of the ruin upon the human family is really described by three verbs. She took, she ate, and she gave. It's, a, it's, a, it's an anti-communion. It's a sacramental fall. We fell by an act of eating. She took of its fruit and ate and gave to her husband with her. He ate, and then their eyes were opened, and they knew their shame. They knew that they were naked. That's the consequence that comes. But the act of, of uh, sin was this three verbs. She took, she ate, she gave, and then their eyes were opened, and they knew their shame. That is, they covered their their generative members or sexual members because they recognized that their sin had, had come upon them and all of their potential children. Uh, they were thinking in a federal sense, all of, all of us fell uh, in Adam. And so they cover their sexual members. They recognize the disaster. Uh, on some level, they recognize the disaster that brought upon the human family by their disobedience. So, now, why then do the evangelists frame Jesus' death, his suffering on the cross and his glory, the resurrection, with these two suppers? In the supper uh, of the, we call the Last Supper, the Passover Supper, uh, Jesus takes the bread and blesses it and breaks it and says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat, and he gives it to them. So the Lord is very deliberately taking the three verbs that describe the fall of man and using those same three verbs to undo the fall. That is, he uses those three verbs to describe our redemption. That is, the, the history of redemption is coming to a, a climax and a conclusion here. He is beginning the reverse of the fall in the garden. Uh, Eve took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband with her. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, and he gives it to them. Then he suffers on the cross and he uh, is glorified in the resurrection. Then on Resurrection Sunday in the afternoon, when he is walking in the cool of the day with the Emmaus disciples, uh, he comes, they come to Emmaus in the evening time, and the two disciples press upon him to come in to have 
uh, supper with him, with, with him, or with them. And they don't understand yet who he is. Uh, that he's been masqueraded somehow. He's disguised himself so that they didn't recognize him. They would have known who he was, but they didn't recognize him. But when he takes the bread and blesses it, when he breaks it, they recognize him. My suspicion is they recognized the um, wounds in the hand. And it says, when they saw him, uh, the language that's used by Luke is their eyes were opened and they knew him. And that's the reversal of the consequences of the fall. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the tree, their eyes were open and they knew their shame. When the Emmaus disciples partake of the, the communion of Christ, their eyes are opened, but they know him. And he is called, Paul uses Christ to say, he is the covering for our shame. We are clothed in his righteousness. And so this, this, we see then that there is a beginning of the reversal. Christ came into the world to undo the work of the devil. He begins by undoing the fall itself. And, and then when we see, when we think a, bit, a moment about the resurrection itself, he is resurrected, um, the, 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 the suffering of Jesus takes place between two gardens. Those are also framing devices. It begins in the Garden of Gethsemane, and where he is buried, there is a garden too. And so he comes forth like Adam from the earth, um, Jesus does in resurrection, and uh, he is in a garden uh, where he will have his encounter with Mary Magdalene. And John tells us that she's looking into the tomb and weeping and wondering where the body of Jesus is, and Jesus comes up from behind and speaks to her and says, Woman, why are you weeping? And she turns and barely glances at him. She sees him standing. That's the posture of life in victory. She doesn't expect, she's thinking Christ is dead. So she barely glances behind, sees that this man is talking to her, and she asks him if he's taken the Lord away, where he might uh, have taken him because she assumes, John says, that he's the gardener. And that's not a throwaway line. What that means is that here you have God and the woman in restored to the garden. And that's a part of the redemptive work of Jesus. He is restoring the fellowship of God, in this case, and, and woman in the garden. And so he is the restorer of that fellowship that was broken after the sin of Adam and Eve, and they were driven out of the garden from the presence of the Lord, and now we see the beginnings of that, that um, restoration. What, what follows is then is the judgment, in Genesis, is the ju judgment of the flood, and I think what corresponds to that is the great, great Commission. Jesus sends his disciples into all the world and tells them to teach all the things that he has taught them, which fulfills the prophetic promise that the world will be covered with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So there's the undoing of the flood, the redemptive uh, corollary to the, the flood of Noah is that the knowledge of the Lord uh, is covering the earth. And I, re I really rejoice to see this grand work of God. I've talked to uh, Pastor McCurley. Uh, the work I've heard about in Indonesia, which is uh, amazing, but it's all over the world. The kingdom of Christ is, is, is covering the earth with the knowledge of the redemptive message of God, and that's glorious. Now, I want to show you something of the power of these genealogies in something that has often been overlooked, but I think, you, I think um, because of Dr. Park's emphasis on the genealogies, we can see how valuable that training is. I've got two specific illustrations of that. When we come to Acts 1.8, Jesus tells the disciples they're to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and then they're to be his witnesses, he says, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That's Acts chapter 1 and 8. And so then we read about the... Um, Pentecost. And that is remarkable because Jews have come from all over the Roman Empire and, and places even in Parthia and to the east. And um, 
when the Spirit of God falls upon man, God comes down in grace in a way that anticipates and reverses the judgment of Babel. God came down in judgment at Babel because of the wickedness uh, of, and rebellion of mankind, and he divided the earth into all of these quarreling tribes and languages and, and nations and scattered them over the, uh, the earth. But at Pentecost, we see the reversal of that. God comes down in grace, and then all of a sudden the judgment of tongues is reversed at, uh, for, for the, the, that particular period of time. And everyone hears the gospel in the language in which he was born. There is no longer a uh, language barrier. And so we can see that miraculous undoings of the work of the enemy um, are accomplished after Jesus comes forth from the grave. Coming forth from the grave, by the way, is the reversal, of course, of sin and death, uh, the judgment that fell upon mankind that uh, we, we must certainly die. That's undone in the resurrection. But in Acts 1.8, we have this, Jesus says, I want you to testify uh, to me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, but also to Samaria and the ends of the earth. And how is that worked out? The evangelist Luke tells us very specifically. He has three road narratives, three narratives of three major conversions that take place upon roads. They're very famous roads. And all the roads lead away from Jerusalem. They're going to the ends of the earth. So we see that what Christ had prophesied in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, is now going to be demonstrated. Uh, there will be three major conversions, the three first prominent conversions to the Christian faith that will take places upon roads leading away from Jerusalem. Uh, the first one is uh, the road to Gaza from Jerusalem. And that's in uh, Acts chapter uh, 8. And the one that is converted there is the Ethiopian eunuch, who is the, uh, he's a prominent man. He's in charge of all of the treasures of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. A very, very prominent, highly educated man. Um, and, and, and he comes to Christian faith and is actually baptized on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's chapter 8 in Acts. In chapter 9, we have the famous road to Damascus. And Saul of Tarsus is uh, converted. Of course, he becomes the Apostle Paul. But Saul of Tarsus is converted on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus. And then in chapter 12, we have the road that goes from Jerusalem to Joppa and then to Caesarea, the, the port city, Caesarea Maritima. And that will be the conversion of Cornelius, the, the centurion of Rome. Now, the significance of that is, is very, very profound if you know your genealogies and you recognize that Luke, Luke's purpose is to tell us that the gospel is for all the nations. It embraces every nation and people and tribe and tongue, as John would say. But Luke is telling us that the gospel is for all the nations, and he represents that by having... Um, three salvation narratives, the Ethiopian eunuch, the Saul of Tarsus, and Cornelius of Rome. They're very carefully chosen. Uh, we'll recognize the Ethiopian eunuch is a son of Ham. Saul of Tarsus, of course, is a son of Shem, and Cornelius of Rome is a son of Japheth. So that becomes meaningful, but only if we know our genealogies. It's not explicitly stated, but it's very clearly inferred and the message for that is wonderful. That is the gospel message. All the sons of Noah are being invited to come home to the Lord. They were scattered at Babel, but now they're being called home to the Lord. Like Paul says, they will with one nation and one tongue celebrate the redemptive glory of God in Christ Jesus. Um, the seed of the woman, the seed of the virgin, the wonderful redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ has made this glorious universal gospel possible. And um, that's really remarkable. And that's the larger setting for the, uh, the Genesis genealogies, anticipating the, the other works, largely based on the genealogy in Matthew 1 and the three sections of that, as, as we know. Part 2 that I wanted to look to, how was the enmity of the serpent expressed against the seed of the woman in the history of redemption? We're told that God said, I will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So where does that, where does that enmity erupt? 
And obviously the enmity is, I think we can understand this from Revelation 12, where this is poetically represented, the woman who is in labor and travail, who is clothed, who is uh, crowned with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars, which obviously speaks uh, because of the Joseph dream of Israel. When the woman is in labor to bring forth the seed of the woman, the dragon, the serpent of old, is waiting to devour the child. So that, that is the, the key thing that we recognize in the history of redemption is the enmity, the enmity unto death of the seed of the serpent that wants to destroy the seed. And there are a number of times when, um, when he, he will make that attempt. If the, if the enemy is successful in destroying the seed, then obviously we can't have a redeemer. So, um, the first time we see something like this, I believe, and there are seven of these that I want to talk about, there are more, but I want to talk about these seven, is with the story of Cain and Abel, and um, I don't have time to go into that in fullness, but Eve has two sons. Her, her firstborn is Cain, and then afterward, the afterborn son is Abel. And we're told specifically uh, by John, 1 John 3, 12, that Cain was of the evil one. And I take that to mean he was the seed of the serpent. And certainly that seems to be the case uh, as we read the Genesis story. The battle is to the death and out of envy because uh, Abel's sacrifice was accepted where his sacrifice wasn't, uh, which sounds very much like Carmel, where God rejects the sacrifice of the priests of Baal, but he accepts the sacrifice of the prophet Elijah. It sounds like something similar to that happened, and Cain was overcome with jealousy and envy, and that enmity was begotten in his heart, where he ultimately killed Abel, and so Abel will have no genealogy. But God will appoint another son, and that is Seth, who, through whom the seed promise will continue. And that's, uh, that seems to me to be typical of this kind of enmity that we're seeing being developed. Now, the second time that this, uh, this enmity erupts is when Israel is captive in Egypt and Pharaoh is, is persecuting the people of God. In the Bible, Pharaoh is described as the twisting serpent of the Nile in Ezekiel 29.3. And the prophet says, Behold, I am against you, or the Lord says through the prophet, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great Tanim, serpent. And that's the serpent, when Aaron makes his rod into a serpent, it is a Tanim, who lies in the midst of the rivers. And so Pharaoh shows his enmity against the people of God by attempting to destroy the seed. He's like the dragon hovering over the woman. We remember his... his uh, uh, a covert attempt to destroy the male seed by, uh, by eliciting the Hebrew midwives to uh, commit infanticide if a male child was born. Had they been successful, and then after that fails, uh, Pharaoh commands his own people to cast this precious male seed of Israel into the, into the Nile. Had that attempt uh, succeeded, had he destroyed all the male seed, there could be no redeemer. And so God then will send a deliverer. But, and, and remarkably too, God, uh, when Pharaoh cast the male seed of Israel into the river, when we come to the redemptive event of Moses, who was born during that particular persecution, God will hurl Pharaoh and his hosts into the sea. So there's a, uh, there's a magnificent vindication of the, of the law of God in the destiny that happens to the serpent, uh, he will crush him beneath waters. There is a response of the Lord to Pharaoh's attempt to destroy the male seed of Israel. Pharaoh throws the male seed of Israel into the river, and God, in the redemption, through Moses, will cast Pharaoh and his hosts into the sea, and they will be crushed by the waters that fall upon them. And um, this attempt will correspond to um, the, the attack of Herod, uh, another attempt to destroy the male seed who has been identified as coming uh, at Bethlehem. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to tie these two together. Uh, one of the things that's remarkable about this is that the question is, when Pharaoh realized he'd been deceived by the midwives, 
he gave a command to destroy the male seed, how far back did he go? And there is some indication. Uh, Moses, of course, would, be, would have been covered by that decree, and he was three months old. But we do know that Moses' brother Aaron uh, did not seem to be subject to that decree, and we're told that, that Aaron was three years older than Moses. If you know your genealogies, you recognize that, which means that Pharaoh's decree probably went back for two years, and that corresponds precisely to the account of, of Herod, who was deceived by the wise men, who he had, he had asked them carefully, when did the star appear? And he issues a decree that all the male seed in Bethlehem are to be destroyed uh, up to, uh, from two years old and younger. If you know the genealogies, that harmonizes perfectly. It's, it's teaching us that Herod is a new pharaoh, and Israel has become the land of bondage uh, under uh, his, his reign. Uh, the next occurrence of the enmity of the seed of the woman begins with David. And David, of course, is the seed of the woman. The covenant will be made with him prospectively, but he is, he is the anointed king. Uh, Samuel anoints him king in 1 Samuel 16. And through his line, the Messiah will come, the, the seed of the woman. Now David, uh, in chapter 17, we see this enactment, a dramatic enactment of Genesis 3.15. David is the anointed of the Lord. He is too young, however, for battle. His three older brothers, their eight brothers, sons of Jesse, the three oldest brothers are enlisted in the army, but the younger brothers are not, and David is the youngest brother. He's still identified with the tent of his mother. He is the shepherd. He's too young for battle. And so David... Um, is sent by his father. His father sends David, who is a picture of Jesus, uh, with gifts to bring to the army that is camped in the field. And there is a champion among the Philistines, and his name is Goliath. And the chronicler is very careful to describe Goliath. His confidence is all in his armor. He's an impressive man of about nine feet tall. And he is dressed in bronze armor, and that's significant because bronze, the Hebrew word is nehoshet, which is a homonym that sounds like the word nehosh, which is serpent. And he's dressed in scale armor, so he's going to have this scale appearance. He's going to look serpentine. He's going to look the part of the serpent. And in the drama, he will represent the serpent, and David, who is too young for battle, will go forth to battle dressed in the loincloth of a shepherd, uh, he's going, clearly going to be the, um, the seed of the woman, represent the seed of the woman. Once we understand the account of the battle between David and Goliath in light of Genesis 3.15, we can foresee the whole outcome and its destiny into the, into the details. Uh, Goliath, the serpent, challenges Israel to single combat he says, you choose a champion, and I will represent my people, and he will represent Israel, and we will fight, and that way there will be no complete battle or war. And the outcome of the destiny of the nation will depend upon this one fight. And the issue is, who will be in perpetual bondage? Will it be the Philistines, or will it be Israel? And no one in Israel is courageous enough to take to the field. The only one who is willing to take to the field is David. And the reason for that is very clear. He has been anointed by the prophet who has told him he will be king in Israel. And David knows, because he must be king, that he is invincible. Nothing can prevent that prophecy from taking place. And so he, he, he finds out what will be done for the one who is victorious over this, this giant, this serpent, and he's promised that he will be given a bride, so a royal bride. So ultimately, uh, that aspect of the history of redemption is in view as well. He was promised a royal bride. So he goes to the field of battle. Um, uh, Saul has no faith. He, Saul's trust is in his armor, just like Goliath's trust was in his armor. But David goes to battle with a slingshot, and he takes a stone. 
And we know already the outcome. We should know already the outcome because the prophecy has foretold it that somehow the serpent's head will be crushed in this battle. And so David goes to the uh, field of battle and he takes his slingshot and he lodges a stone right between the eyes in Goliath's skull. And that stuns the giant. Whether he dies at that moment or not, we don't know, but he falls flat on his face. And David doesn't have a sword, so he goes and takes the sword of Goliath and beheads the giant when he raises up that skull to show to the Philistines they flee because they know that their destiny now has been one of, uh, will be one of bondage. Now, what's significant about this story is often overlooked because we've seen an enactment of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the one who is destined to be in the line of the seat of the woman, that's David, has crushed the head of this enemy of God and, and he's, he's taken um, the head of Goliath. That's, that's his uh, uh, booty. That's, that's he, everything that belonged to Goliath on the field of battle, according to the law of heroes, now belongs to David. But he does something very remarkable with this head. David has already chosen Jerusalem to be the, his capital city, although he doesn't yet control it. It's still held by the Jebusites, the Canaanite uh, fortress that is uh, six miles north of Bethlehem. So David knew this, this area very well. It's a gated city. Uh, it's, been, it's held out from the time of Joshua to the present, but David recognizes that that's the city that would be best aligned on the border of Benjamin and Judah to be the capital of a united Israel. And so he, it, it's remarkable, he takes that skull, uh, the Hebrew word for skull is gullet, so he takes that skull and he takes it to Jerusalem. Well, why would he take that skull to Jerusalem when he doesn't even control Jerusalem? He's not certainly not even king, but he, he has designs on it. There is outside of the gate of that city a very famous hill, and that's the hill of Moriah. And David knows that um, on the hill of Moriah, Abraham offered up Isaac, and the promise of God was that uh, at that place, on that hill of Moriah, the provision of the lamb would be made. And he knows that that's the great victory that the seed of the woman will accomplish. And to betoken that, to give evidence of that, he takes, he knows that the victory that has been given to him was a victory given by the Lord. So he takes that skull to Jerusalem. He can't go in the city. So he buries that skull on a hill outside of the gate of Jerusalem on Moriah. And that hill, we know, you can, you can hear it in the lineage, uh, the homonyms, it's the place of the skull. It's Golgullet, which memorializes the name of Goliath of Gath, which becomes Golgotha. And so that's the place of the skull. David has identified where the great battle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent will take place. Now quickly, my time is running out, but um, Solomon, there is an eruption of this battle in the lineage of uh, David's son, Solomon. When Solomon, when David dies, his, uh, or is dying, his son Adonijah, the brother of Absalom, makes a, uh, a move to take the kingdom illicitly and illegally because David has already pledged that it would go to Solomon. And so, but Adonijah wants to be king, and so he, he sends a bunch of uh, warriors ahead of him. He's going to have a coronation, private coronation, Oh, a public coronation, but he's going to coronate himself, crown himself king. And he does it, interestingly, by the serpent stone, Zohelet. Zohelet is the Hebrew word for serpent. It's in Jerusalem. It's at at the Gehenna Valley down down by Hakeldama, where where Judas hanged himself. And it's across the uh, Gehenna Ravine, looking from the city of David. And he's going to have his coronation, his rival coronation, his uh, uh, coup, uh, by the stone Zohelet, which is the serpent stone. 
And near the serpent stone, the chronicler tells us in 1 Kings, is the spring of the traitor, the, the treader. It's Ein Rogel. Rogel is from the Hebrew word regal, which means foot, and a rogel is participial form, one who treads with the foot. And so ironically, here is the Genesis 3.15 being spoken of, the serpent, and the one who would crush the head of the serpent. And what happens is uh, Adonijah is coronating himself as king, but unknown to him, God is working through Nathan the prophet in Bathsheba to have Solomon installed upon the throne of David. That begins with the Gihon Spring. He, he comes into Jerusalem on a mule, uh, imitating the humility of Christ who will come on the foal of an ass, foal of a donkey. So uh, that, that's the place of the skull, and that's the, the place of the serpent, um, Zohelet. With Hezekiah, who is also now we're in the line of the genealogy of the, uh, the seed of the woman, uh, when Hez good king Hezekiah comes to the throne, he recognizes that many in Israel have been, or Judah, have been sub seduced by the idolatry of worshiping the bronze serpent that Moses raised in the wilderness, and they call it Nehushtan. Um, Nehoshet, as I said, is the word for bronze, but it's a serpent, and they worshiped it as an idol god. And so Hezekiah takes that idol as it had become, uh, originally given by God for a healing in Israel, but now having been made a snare in Israel, he takes that, that idol God and crushes it. It's the PL stem. It's intensive and iterative. He crushes it into powder. So here is Hezekiah, who is in the line of the seed of the woman, emblematically destroying the serpent. And so we see, we see this theme going through the whole Bible of this quarrel between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. When we come to the book of Esther and uh, Mordecai, and we're told about Haman, who is an Agagite, that is, he is descended from the Amalekite tribe, uh, he has a decree to destroy all the Jews, as we know, and it's, he arranges to have it signed by the king. And this law, had it been affected, would have deprive the world of Redeemer because the whole um, clan at that point, uh, the whole tribe of, of Judah and the people of Israel would have been destroyed. But uh, through the uh, piety and, and, the, and the faithfulness of Esther and Mordecai, God so works it that Haman is the one who is destroyed on the very gallows tree that he was raising up for Mordecai. When we come to the account of Jesus, we see that Herod, uh, and the family of the Herods is like this hydra, this seven-headed um, serpentine chimera and monster. Uh, all of these kings that are Herods are evil and wicked. And Herod, the Herod the Great, the progenitor of this, is the one who wants to destroy the Christ and who issues that decree to destroy all the male seed of Bethlehem. So we see that he is taking the role of the seed of the serpent, the actual seed of the serpent are actually going to be lodged in the temple in Jerusalem. That's the Pharisees and Sadducees who will destroy, um, or will attempt to destroy Christ, and uh, of course, by arranging for the crucifixion. So we see the climax of the history of redemption in Revelation 12. When the woman brings, brings forth the, the son, he's caught up to God into the throne. That's really a narrative not of his nativity, but of his resurrection. He's born, he's given the scepter, the iron scepter of David, that's from Psalm 2, and he reigns on the throne of heaven. And he has escaped uh, the intention of the serpent to bring about his death. And in doing that, we see what a wonderful savior we have. Uh, like, I, lo I love what Moses says in the oldest Psalm, Psalm 90, verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, and all the generations that have been looking for the seed of the woman, for the Messiah of Israel, all of the nations who have been looking in faith to God to keep his promises have found that he has kept those promises perfectly in Christ Jesus. God is faithful in all generations, and now all mankind everywhere in all the world is invited to trust God and his Son, who is the Redeemer of the world. 
And so it's my prayer that the gospel of God would extend his mercy to all who are in the world, to all the saints uh, in Indonesia, and all the rest of the world as well. And that God, we pray that God would bless his people and bless his gospel, that many would come. All are invited, all the sons of Noah are invited to find that God has truly kept the promises of all the genealogies in all the Bible by giving us the seed of the woman, this glorious Messiah, Redeemer of Israel and the nations. And so we ask that he would bless his gospel to all the earth and to everyone to hear that the, the offer is for salvation to everyone who will simply hear and believe. And we ask for Jesus' sake that the Spirit of God would give the faith to believe to everyone, to the ends of the world, until the end of the ages. Amen. We understand the meaning of genealogy for us, especially how the restoration of Noah's descendants such as Shem, Ham, and Japheth was fulfilled after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through these two sessions today, we are able to understand the importance of genealogy in the Bible as a channel for inheritance faith to fulfill the administration of history of redemptions for all mankind. This concludes the first day of the Global Webinar 2021, The Word of God Unveiled in Light of History of Redemption. May you receive grace through the studies, testimonies, and praises given today. We hope to see you back here tomorrow at 6 p.m. for more unveiling of the Bible's mysteries. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we give thanks for the first day Global Webinar 2021 that has taken place. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that has opened our eyes to the Word of God in the Bible, so that we are convinced about the inerrancy of the Bible. We will end today's webinar. Please guide us all so we can attend the following webinars. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.